It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. I'm host Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin tonight with Dan DeFaw. Before we get started, we want to help you save some money. That's right, folks. Uh, don't forget to use our promo codes to save that money. And let's start off with BuckBaits.com. That's right, the brick-and-mortar store of BuckBaits down at Sterling Heights, Michigan at 15 and Dodge Park. Go over there. If you're on the website, BuckBaits.com, use the promo code UNJ20. That will get you 20% off your order. For those of you who are looking for Easy Cut products, make sure you go to EasyCutProducts.com. And when you're there, use the UNJ promo code UNJ15 off to save 15% off your order. And let's not forget Lincoln Roan over at Packermax.com. It's never too early, never too late to think about the Packermax. Go on over to Packermax.com, use the promo code UNJ25. That'll give you $25 off your order over at Packermax Outdoor. For those of you looking for some new firearms and firearm products, make sure you go over to the islandarmory.com. While you're there shopping, use the promo code UNJ. J10 to save 10% off your order there. If you shot that bird of a lifetime and you want it mounted, don't forget Troublesome Creek Taxidermy. We've had them live on the show. We've talked to them. Uh, you want to get 10% off your order, go to Facebook, go to troublesome.creek.7, find their website. If you go to our website, UNJ, make sure to click on the button to download the form. You get 10% off over there using the code UNJ10. Looking for that game call, whether it be a squirrel, whether it be goose, duck, deer, make sure you go to J. JPO Game Calls. Look for them at jpogamecalls.com. And while you're there shopping, use the UNJ10 promo code to save 10% off your order. And Miller Deer Tracking, the man that seems to never sleep during deer season, get 20% off your next deer tracking uh, using the promo code UNJ20. Look for Miller Deer Tracking on Facebook or give him a call over at 810-240-4891. Looking for the hottest new plastics to take on the water, whether it be hard water or soft water, make sure you go over to southernindianabaitco.com. While there, use the UNJ promo code UNJ10 to save 10% off your order. Deer Camp Coffee, folks. We drink it every night on the show. You want to try it? You can go to the brick and mortar store at 15 and Dodge Park at Deer Camp itself or go to DeerCampCoffee.com. Also use our promo code UNJ10. You get 10% off your order. And don't forget, get a bag of the UNJ Medium Roast Blend there as well. All right, Danny. Where's our live view camera look from tonight? Welcome back to the live show here from the cabin, folks. And our live look today, we are looking, actually, we're rotating up and down Lake, the river up in St. Clair, Michigan. Uh, we just had a nice big freighter go by, and, of course, it didn't make it. It left us. But it is 65 degrees, and look at that camera. Yeah, it's raining here, folks, and it is raining outside. Looks like it's windy, too, and I, I can't believe you couldn't have held that boat, that freighter back and told him, wait till we I go tried. live. I said, hey, could you please stop? And, yeah. You know, short guy never never gets any uh, attention, right? But what was that? The Al, Al, Algama? Al Alcoma. Alcoma that's heading upbound. Yep. Heading to Charlevoix with a load of something or going to get a load of something. Going to get a load, I think you said. We, you looked it up on that uh, app, right? Yeah, the marine app. Pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, it looks, the waters are looking a little bit breezy. Be, uh, a, be a, a windy blow out there to be out there fishing right now. I tell you what, um, we'll talk about it. About it next week, our fishing trip with uh, Captain Scott over the weekend. When we had started heading out, we had some nice rollers. It looked like it was going to be one of those long, yeah. but it just phew, went to glass. Make you seasick? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, But, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Yes, we are. It's been two weeks since we've been off. I uh, had the 4th of July. Hopefully everybody has all 10 fingers with them as i always say in the fourth of july bring them all home so you got the trigger trigger fingers with you or the fingers and the finger and thumb you use to crank in those baits and right fish. exactly you lose them you, you just can't get out there no you can't it makes it hard exactly and a big shout out to uh if you remember last year deer camp coffee uh here locally down in dodge park um was voted best coffee shop uh and they're up for that vote again this year. So if you don't mind getting over to WDIV, best of the best, finding Deer Camp Coffee Roasting Company and give them a vote. They squeaked it out last year uh, to, for the win. And um, so we're going to help them 
push, try to get it Get Another mine. victory, right? Get mine right here tonight. So get out over there and, and vote for them. So how you been? I've been doing great. We had, oh man, headed up to the cabin, opened it up. It was everything good. Everything was good except for one little mishap, and it was by no fault of anybody human. We think. Okay. You know, you know the pump. The yeah. well pump, right? Yeah. And on the bottom of the well pump is the drain plug. You, yeah. You pull that, you drain the pump, right? Yeah, right. So the process is unscrew that, take it, and, and set it down right there. You dropped it or lost it? No. Um, the cabin was closed up last year, and it was set there, and... It's not there. It's not there. So a varmint got it. We're pretty sure a mouse in the head and it's shiny new kitchen table or something in their little den they're sitting there eating over top of the plug right okay. and so i had to run to town <laughs> get the right plug uh we switched it out and everything went fine but the weather was fantastic uh sounds and, like you need to run a trap line up there we were kelly was she <laughs> she got 11 hell 11 she got 11 inside or outside inside wow it was it was a blast it was fun we yeah. had so much fun and you gotta go to grown balls, man. When they come through town, sell them first, man. Well, you <laughs> know what? It, 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 to tell you the truth, it was very odd because in the summertime we never have mice. Okay. So we have no idea. It was it was totally odd because it's usually warm outside, mm -hmm. so they don't usually need to come inside. Yeah, they set up shop. Yeah, they did. Well, Kelly was on the hunt, and uh, I stopped at Blades Baits, um, and I picked up a couple lures. Um, I see that you got a whole uh, accoutrement of uh, lures here, right? And I think we need to take ourselves up. And as everybody knows, uh, a couple weeks ago we were supposed to have on Patrick from Hud's Lures. Uh, we had a little issue; we had to cancel that show. But we're, we're live tonight, and of course, uh, being the Daily Press, uh, this is their show tonight that we're doing. Uh, their interview for them for Hud's Fishing Lures is tonight's guest. And folks, if you remember, right, November three, four, and five. Uh, coming up in November will be the biggest UP ice fishing and hunting expo and it's free to everybody So you go on over there if you want to come up and visit Come we'll be there. That's right. We're gonna be there live. We're gonna have some fun, but uh, standing by with us live is Patrick from HUD's lures Patrick, how you doing tonight? Hey, guys? hey Danny Mike, how you doing? Doing great, man We've got we've got a signal all the way from Rapid River, Michigan up near the south shore, no, the north shore of Lake Michigan. Right? And, uh, man, it is so good to have you on. I stopped at Blades Baits, uh, obviously, to talk to them. We've had them on the show. Uh, we've stopped. We, we, I picked up a few of your lures there, and um, so I, we got them here, and you sent me some more, so we have them as we talk about them. But kind of give us a little background about... Man, how do you get into doing this kind of stuff, making this kind of fishing jewelry? Well, I grew up on Lake Ontario in upstate New York, and my dad always took us out on the bay, and we'd be trolling for brown trout and lake trout, and they're from Messina, New York, on the St. Lawrence River, so I grew up throwing baits for pike and muskie and smallmouth up in the St. Lawrence. And those have always been sort of mystical to me. I, I remember before the, the snow would melt, and the ice would come off, I'd be going through my tackle box and shining up my lures, getting ready for the, the spring to come so I could get out and start fishing. It sort of drove my dad nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, that's sort of where it started. And uh, from there, uh, being in the Air Force, I traveled all, all around the United States and, and uh, picked up a lot of different tactics and techniques from all over. And uh, that's sort of how it started. Um, I was in Germany. I couldn't fish for three years in Germany. I had a deployment in the middle of it, but for three years, I just sort of let my brain wander, and I started making spinners. My wife affectionately referred to them as my arts and crafts project. <laughs> but, uh, I made some, some pretty good spinners, and then when I got back to the States, I just sort of went a little further with it, depending on where I was. South Carolina, I made a, I made a bunch of uh, bass, bass lures, and then Arizona, there's not much of anything there, so... <laughs> I started making harnesses in Green Bay, and we migrated further north and ended up in Rapid River, Michigan, and 
and I just I found a little gap here. You know, there's some other folks up here that make moonshine lures and, and uh, beaver lures, ice fishing and salmon, but there was nothing for you know, the folks that like to throw something off a dock and catch bass or pike or walleye. And so I started popping them out of my spinner room here and trying new things and testing this and that and, and came up with a, a pretty good repertoire of, uh, of baits. Well, first off, let me say thank you, thank you, thank you for your service. And your wife, I understand what we talked before the show, it was in the service as well. Yep. So thank you both for, for making uh, that sacrifice for us to be able to have the freedom to hunt, fish, travel, do all the things we do here in this great state of Michigan and this great country in the United States. So, uh, You're very welcome. With all, my pleasure. With all of that traveling, you said, and we talked before the show a little bit, you, you got the opportunity to travel around quite a bit. Uh, I imagine that, first off, starting in New York, the things you fish for there sound a lot like what we have here in Michigan, so it's a perfect place to set up shop here and make lures, but uh, I, met, I bet you really got an opportunity to fish for some really cool stuff traveling the world. Uh, yeah, mostly, I'd say the most exciting was probably Alaska. You, you just can't go wrong, and what I learned there was don't go cheap on hooks because uh, <laughs> a nice curvy uh, one-aught double hook will be straightened out in a heartbeat by a 35-pound uh, king salmon that has a bad attitude and wants nothing to do with being in a boat. <laughs> That's so, good. Uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to, uh, I caught a 50-pound king there. I caught so many silvers that my elbow still hurts from setting the hook. So that was just uh, one, like number three blue fox spinners. Wow. And the first thing we would do is trade out the hooks and put gamagatsus on them because, if, like I said, if you had a weak hook on there, they're going to find it. And uh, that was real exciting. And uh, I learned about making quality when I lived up there. I, did, I don't want somebody to come to me and say, oh, you know, I had a fish on and this is a result and he shows me a, a bent treble hook and they lost a fish of a lifetime. You know, so I, make, I make sure I use the best components I can find. You know, as I look at some of the stuff Danny has here that he picked up, um, that's the first thing I noticed. Everything looks really robust. It doesn't look like some, some cheap uh, stamped out part. Uh, the, everything looks like it's high quality, really strong. Uh, you, you know, right down to even the, the skirts on, on some of these spinners is, is just amazing. It's some, the work that this went into them, you can tell that these are really high quality uh, lures. So, but yeah, I, I got to imagine out there in Alaska, uh, the salmon out there are not like the salmon here in Michigan by any stretch of the imagination. No, no, they're, uh, they're just a fish with an attitude. When they come straight <laughs> in out of the ocean, they're strong, they're powerful, yeah. and uh, and if you had a weak link somewhere, you bolt your net, your line, your lure, they'll absolutely find it and break your heart. Oh, and uh, I don't want that to happen to anybody that, that buys anything that's got Hud's, Hud's fishing lures on it. I want to make sure they're, they're stout, and uh, I do a lot of testing. i got some local folks here that, that take my spinners, and, uh, and they'll chuck them around, and, and they'll see if there's a weak spot, if the colors aren't great, if there's a... If the blades are too big or too small, if they don't spin like they should, we do a lot of testing locally, and uh, to make sure that when I sell something to somebody, it's it's going to do the job. You know, uh, looking through your looking through your pictures here on Facebook, and if any, anybody's out there, uh, go over to Hud's Fishing Lures on their Facebook page, give them a like, give them a share, check them out. But I also noticed in your pictures that you do crawler harnesses as well. Yeah, um, I mean, we're next to the walleye capital of the world at Little Bay to Knock. I'm only 10 minutes away. How could I not do crawler harnesses? Right. I agree. Initially, I initially didn't, and I, I started going to farmer's markets, and people look at me like I was from outer space. They said, where's your harnesses? I said, okay, I guess I'll start tying crawler harnesses. So I got a little example here. I've got, I just go six different colors. I do brass and nickel, and I do uh, some Kurtz colors, and... Uh, I make sure that it's 18 pound test, really good hooks. Make sure that people have uh, some quality harnesses, and and uh, I compete with a lot of the local folks. There's guys here that've been tying them for decades, and the local fishermen tend to be very loyal to a brand. But I'm trying to break into that just a little bit. Right, and and what? So out of those out of those blades, out of your six different blades, what is the most favorite that they seem to go after? They like the colors. They like the chartreuse and the orange. Okay. Uh, the perch color. This specifically, this this perch color here that's got chartreuse and orange and black. Yeah. I really love this. 
I personally prefer brass and nickel. You can't go wrong with, with the basics. They work well for me. My wife loves a brass. I throw a nickel. And uh, they work great. And this, you got to have the right size so you want to be able to get the right depth. Okay. A three and a half or a number four Colorado blade is to the right depth. All right, so she fish as is a fisher. Uh, she's an angler as well. Let me put it that way. Absolutely. Yep. It's my butt. All right. Honestly, now you got you got to give it up. Who's a better Who's a better angler? She's she's better at trolling. Absolutely. She puts a harness on, and she'll sit in the back of the boat. And I'm in the front face. You know, I'm I'm the trolling motor. I'm fighting the waves. <laughs> you know, the sun's in my eyes, and uh, but she'll be. She just concentrates. She does not give in. And I'm, I'm getting hungry, it's time to go, and she's like, come on, let's go a little longer, a little longer, let's troll back to the dock, you know, that sort of thing. She does not give an inch. That's she just awesome. absolutely loves it. You know, that, that that's a true a true companion, friend, yes. uh, partner for life, man. If, they, if they'll get in there and, and, and last it out in, in conditions like that and, and still want to stay out and going out, um, that hats off to, to you, man. That's, that's a awesome. Absolutely, you know, and that's one of the things – uh, you know, having that partner out there doing that, and, and obviously she's one of your testers, right? If you, or does, oh, yeah. she, or does she come up with some ideas for you to put together? She just, she's like, whatever, you, whatever you think I should be using. So I'll, I'll try to put the, the most, uh, what I think is going to be the, the best and most efficient, because I want to see her. She calls it thumping when, when something hits the rod and the rod's bouncing. She says, I got a thumper, I got a thumper, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty exciting because. Oftentimes it's first, but every once in a while she'll she'll look into a really nice walleye, and, and we get pretty excited about that. Absolutely, big shout out to Charles Byram calling or watching from Iowa, uh, Iowa, right? Haven't seen him on in a while. Good and to see you back in the show. Yeah, absolutely. Nancy Jackson, I, I got to correct Nancy. You're you're Air Force, correct? Yes, I am. Not Navy. He's Air Force. No, so. no, no, no. She's talking I about like the lures. <laughs> I like the Navy, but uh, yeah, my wife and I both Air Force. You know, uh, they uh, they got the planes versus being on the water. They, they like to be on the water in their own boat, not on, on a naval yeah. ship. So, uh, but I got to ask this question. So, if you're out there fishing together and you say she's better at trolling, uh, is there is there some friendly competition between the two? Usually, we'll start with you know who's whoever gets the first fish, like a lot of folks do when they get on the boat, mostly to get sort of break the ice and get the day going okay it, it, um, have you ever rigged up something to give you the advantage over her <laughs> <laughs> he's laughing he's, 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 not, he's, not, she's not she's not watching she's upstairs right now but uh <laughs> no i'm i make absolutely sure that that she's set and ready to go okay and uh, oftentimes she likes to catch perch and we catch a lot of perch in the local lakes and, and in the bay and i just assume not have a perch bothering me, you know, all afternoon. So I'll put a flicker shad or something else on there that won't catch perch. And lo and behold, I'll put a three inch flicker shad and catch a four or four inch perch right after I put it out. All right. Well, Na- Nancy's calling me out right, right now. Right. She's letting me have it. Don't get any ideas. Because um, her and I are, are super competitive about everything. <laughs> right. And so, you know, t- speaking of your lures, uh, starting off with our selection that we have to look at. You got. You sent me a box of four of these. These here. Um, I don't know what size they are, so that's why I'm asking you. That and is. That's, I call that a dock spinner. It's a number three French blade. French blade with a three sixteenths ounce weight, and a a, fo- a number four treble hook. What I found, um, and I go to farmers markets, and what I found there is. There's a lot of folks that just, they come here, they go to Gladstone, they'll fish off the dock, the Little Rapid River, or, or, uh, and they'll fish off the dock, and there's not a lot of good lures for people that don't have real expensive gear to throw. Okay. So I created these kits. I've got two different kits. One's called the, that's what you're holding up. I call it the dock spinner. It's heavy enough for somebody with, with a Zepco that's standing on a dock or on shoreline to be able to throw it. It's got enough flash that they can catch bass and pike and walleye with these things and not spend seven or eight dollars for a for a map spinner my that kit itself for four for four lures in the kits fourteen dollars okay so, very and they're, economical they're real solid right and, and i've got 
in in the kit there's two brass and two nickel now i notice you have one of each um the the blade is smooth and the other blade looks hammered yep. so yep. just to give it a little variation what does I got that, some others that are diamond cut what does that do to the to the to the blade itself when it's going through the water it doesn't it doesn't do anything except add a little more flash it's like a fluted blade or a diamond cut blade just gets a little more flash in the water okay so you're looking you're okay so you're looking for the added flicker in the water for the fish's eye to catch yeah exactly okay maybe we have that and the regular brass and the regular regular nickel are in there because they're just traditional and they work you okay. can't you, you don't mess with what works and it's always worked it always works right exactly like you said these are nice and these are small enough um to throw like you said off the dock uh, and go after those those type of fish for the people that aren't getting out on the boats um but even then if you're in the right area like i know up where i was off in the michigami i probably could roll those get those above the weeds and um as long as i kept them above the weeds because those are not weedless or else uh, I will be a little upset. But yes, will. right, but you know, that's a great you know. And if anybody wants to, uh, how do they get a hold of Hud's Fishing Lures? Uh, we have your Facebook page here. It, do they contact you through there? I I can be contacted through my Facebook page or via email Hud's Fishing Lures at Yahoo dot com. And I've got ten local um, businesses up in the UP that carry my my lures as well as one. Uh, blow the braid. The Shore Bait and Tackle, Blades Bait and Tackle, View Bait and Tackle, Rapid River Hardware, Dave's Outboard, um, the Earth Store here on 513 right up the road from me, and two folks uh, in uh, in Manistique, Top of the Lake and Linda's Bread Box in Manistique. I'll carry my spinner. All right. And then I also see, uh, you know, going from those little guys, I see you've got some, you, you create some spinner baits as well. I do, I, I do some um, bigger pike spinner baits. Like I said, I grew up fishing for pike. I really enjoy it, and I caught a lot of uh, bass when I was in California stationed uh, at Bill Air Force Base. But uh, I like throwing big, big spinner baits for pike. So I do some big um, number eight, number nine willow blades, ounce, ounce and a half, up to two and a half ounce weights with a, a big hook on it. With with a nice a nice skirt on a big skilt silicone, uh, silicone skirt for guys to get out and chuck for bike and for muskies. There you go. And uh, a question coming in off the chat. Uh, where did it go? I had it here. Um, all right. So we just talked a little bit in the beginning of the show. You've kind of been all over the world. Uh, so what is your favorite fish to fish for? And what was your favorite place? I, I'd have to say, even though I, I love fishing for pike and the salmon were awesome, there's nothing better than a four-pound smallmouth just crushing, crushing a lure. And probably my favorite place was Hell's Canyon, Snake River, Hell's Canyon, Idaho. I was stationed in Spokane, Washington at Fairchild Air Force Base. Um, I was lucky enough to be a whitewater raft guide for eight or ten years up there, and we would do long rafting trips in the Hell's Canyon, and I would volunteer to be the last boat. I'd take all the gear, and I would invariably have a nice ultralight rod with me, and I would throw baits and catch smallmouth. Every little eddy would be loaded with smallmouth. So while everybody else is whitewater rafting, I'd be fishing and slowly following them down the river. And uh, you just couldn't go wrong. Just a beautiful, beautiful atmosphere, great fishing. Um, probably probably smallmouth, I'd have to say. He's he's having fun while everybody else is falling out of the boats. Right? <laughs> oh, hey, man. but he volunteered, right? I volunteered. I always said, I'll, I'll be dragged. I'll be the last boat. I'll have 1,000 pounds of camping gear because we camped on the river. We'd, we'd go four-day trips and camp right on the river. And they'd be up ahead, and I'd make sure any stragglers got picked up, but I'd be fishing as much as I possibly could. That's awesome. <laughs> what a life. I know, right? Smart guy. Yeah, everybody else pays for those trips, you know, and gets tossed in the drink, and, and he's volunteering and having the time of his life. Oh, right? yeah. It was fun. That's good stuff. Uh, another lure you sent us um, is a three-quarter ounce 
uh, Pike Bass Bucktail. That you yeah, that's it. same as this guy I got right here. I uh, I make a big Pike Bucktail, this guy here, with a big number six blade. But there's a lot of folks that can't throw this. It's just too big unless you've got some pretty serious gear. This has got a five-out hook. It weighs over an ounce. It's it's for some serious pike fishermen and musky fishermen. But what I did is I downsized. A lot of folks that I would see at the shows or at the markets wanted to fish with it, but they just didn't have the gear. So I made one that's smaller, half ounce. It's got a three-out hook on it. I dropped the blade by two sizes. It's it plenty of flash. There's still plenty of weight. And, and pike and bass will just absolutely crush them. So I know you were throwing, an, you had an ultralight outfit. You'd be, probably be able to throw that bait with your ultralight. Right, exactly. And uh, actually, I got I got the, the big one and the next size. The two you're talking about, I got them side by side for the camera. Yeah. And you can definitely see the size difference uh, in there. And, and that, is a, that is a meaty weight on this one when you throw this one. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. heavy. That, that you you throw that one with an ultralight rod and you know it. It was fun. Yeah. I bet. Good luck, good luck retrieving that. You're gonna have a sore shoulder in, in no time flat. Right. I threw it a couple times just to get the look at the action in the water and, and it's like yeah okay, move on. I only got the right rod for that, so we're not even gonna go there. But uh, I did. We did uh, use the bucktail. Uh, we were using that on the Saginaw Bay. We had that on a down rod that we had. Uh, we had it trailing behind the boat. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get nothing. We in, in actually talking to Captain Scott, the down rods this year he's not doing too well on. Not sure why, but we'll go with it. But uh, yeah, so you know, throwing that up in wherever you might be. Uh, where in Manistee can they? Uh, question is where you can find your lures. The uh, top of the lake, uh, outdoor store, right top in of the Manistee. Lake. And on top Linda, of Linda's bread box is a little bit further uh, than that, but she's got uh, she's got a ton of stuff there. That's a that's a great little place to get uh, any type of gear you want. Salmon, uh, inland lakes, everything from trout to salmon, you can get at Linda's bread box. There you go, Adam. Uh, Adam's on, on our pro staff for our fishing. Uh, he'll be getting some of these lures that you sent me, so we're going to split them up between each other, and we're going to have a little friendly competition. Uh, I'll make sure he gets the dull hook ones. Um, <laughs> None of them should be done unless you're doing it on purpose. He, he, Danny's doing it on purpose. Okay. I'm against, against a rock or something. I'll, I'll, I'll troll him down I-75. There you go. Right? But, uh, not that there's not any competition there at all. Right? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, those set of lures. I'm saving the interesting one for last because I got a few questions about it that uh, we wanted to have you. But uh, So... Before we get there, I wanted to ask you, uh, you were at the show last year, and, and how did it go for the first time having that show? Um, I enjoyed it because of the interaction with, with folks. Um, it, when I'm selling to stores, I don't get to see the people that are buying the lures. I like people walking up to me and asking them about them, and tell them I tell them a little bit about uh, the background, how I, I came to make a certain spinner, why there's a certain size plate or color, and I really love that interaction. Uh, that's where I get the good feedback, and that's how I came up with this dock spinner kit that I went, I did over the winter. Is a lot of folks will they pick up a bigger spinner, and I just they say I just can't throw this; it's too big for my gear. So that's what I used uh, as a as a reason to downsize and make that dock spinner kit or shore spinner kit. You know, uh, so that's one of the things I really enjoy about the show is is the interaction with folks. Folks will come up and say, you know, my, my son caught his first smallmouth on one of your spinners last week. Uh, it, it, I just really get a kick out of knowing that something I put together is helping somebody get out there and, and uh, have fun fishing. Is that not the best? It is. In doing public shows, when we do them ourselves, one of the best interactions you have is when somebody comes up to you, young, old, whatever it might be, it, and it might be their first fish, their first deer, their first bear, whatever. And having them tell you that story with that smile on their face is just, and you can just see it, and it is just awesome. But, you know, like you said, getting that feedback right from the public, you know, that is uh, A number one. Uh, yeah, it's a real kick. I, that's what I, I really get the most fun out of it. That's what, another reason I do the farmer's markets is people will, uh, I'll see them in the 
come back a week after they bought a lure and said, hey, we were out on the Escanaba River and we caught some bass on your spinner last week. That's really what it's about. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll stick, I'll uh, take a spinner to a, a young fisherman. When they buy a kid, I'll throw an extra spinner in there. Hey, what color do you like? And they'll point to one and, and it goes with the other ones. Just uh, so they can get out there and, and uh, do what I did when I was a kid. That's great. And I tell you what, you by you doing that, that simple little gesture to that youngster is just, it, it speaks volumes of what that portrays to them. And you guarantee they'll take that lure and they're going to go try it out, you know. Yep, they're absolutely. often they're often running and and um, you know for yourself you know getting out there coming up with these different colors uh, we're rolling through the pictures as we're talking and, and, and the different colors that you all have um, what is a uh, to you what is like like your your rubber skirts or anything like that what uh, I see you've got white you've got uh, like uh, orange and green um, is there one any in particular that seems to be out and selling the rest? People love chartreuse. Okay. Whether it's whether it's part of the fire tiger skirt on a spinner bait or an inline spinner or a grub on my single hook um, jig spinner, people just love chartreuse. You know, I stick with white and black and chartreuse just because they work. It, it's that simple. Motor oil, that's a really no, another another one that works well. I, you sort of take what you learn bass fishing with worms and uh, and you use it in other areas. Um, while I love crayfish, love gobies, so you've got to try to match the hatch as it was with, with those grubs. And it just it works. It's simple. It's just a little bit of science. Use your brain and uh, and you can make something that, that it's really going to slay them. You know, looking back a little bit, you, you talked about learning as you're making these when you're in the service talking about making quality versus quantity making something that's strong it's going to last it's not going to break off uh you know the hook's not going to bend what have you besides that what what was through them early years the one of the most important things that you learned uh that you remember going through this that's helped you get where you're at today i think it's not taking anything for granted as far as you've got to have the right combination of blade, bead, and clevis on a spinner. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw things together and hand them out to people or sell them to people and expect them to work. Because I've got kicked in the teeth once or twice when I put something together and uh, one of my guys, uh, his name's Chris Schmidt, he's a great fisherman up here, he'll take it out and try it and he'll bring it back and say it doesn't spin. I said, you're kidding me. How does that not spin? And you come to find out it's there's a little bit of science behind it. The friction where the clevis rides on the bead and the size of the blade, there's a little bit of science there. And if you don't get it lined up correctly, it won't work. And there's nothing worse than just spending $10, $12, $15 on a big spinner and you chuck it out there and the spinner, the, the spinner doesn't spin. Mm -hmm. Or it's intermittent and it doesn't work. And I've had it happen. And I don't. I want to make absolutely sure it doesn't happen on any of mine. So the I've learned that you've got to test them before you you even think about putting them in a package and selling them to the public. So you've got uh, obviously you have got somebody that you work with uh, helping you do some of this testing as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris Schmidt. Uh, you, you probably see some pictures there on my Facebook page. He's uh, he's holding a 26 pound king that he caught in the Escanaba River last fall. It was on this orange spinner I'm holding up right now. Simple number four French blade orange spinner, and that was his personal best. And we went through a couple trials with different sizes and hooks that were bending because I was using too small of a hook. And he would take it out there and say, hey, try this color, try that color. The hook's a little bit too light. I'd, I'd go uh, up a size. I went to a one-out hook. I went to a half ounce weight. I got the right size blade, the right size clevis, and, and he'll he'll text me ten minutes after he leaves, leaves my house and said, "Yep, they're spinning great." And then he sends me pictures of kings that he catches or browns or whatever. You know that that has got to be awesome to be able to get instantaneous feedback from yeah. somebody. I mean, you're talking like you said minutes. That hey, it works, it doesn't work. We need to change this a little bit, tweak this. Uh, that kind of information is invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. He, um, he's helped tremendously when it comes to, I've got uh, four different colors. I call them my trout and salmon spinners. 
and uh, it took a little a little bit of trial trial and error to get the right combination but I've got it dialed in thanks to his help that's cool you know and that that's one of the things you, you gotta love getting that instant feedback but I kind of want to know how many uh, of, of these we see the finished product we see what you, you that goes out to the public you are okay with it now how many have hit the factory floor and been <laughs> broken I've and got I've got hundreds of these weird aberrations. I look at them a year later and say, what the heck was I thinking? Why did I do that? You know, I've got a, I'll have a four out worm hook with a, probably a number six fluted Indiana blade and I'll have a purple worm on it. And I'm thinking, what in God's name was I thinking when I did that? It's just some weird combination. And I look at it and say, okay, I can do better than that. But, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of busted up, Bucktails and and uh, and spinner blades and bent wires and beads rolling on the floor and and up clevises and hooks in my thumb and uh, there, there's been a lot of that. So how many of those weird to odd combinations have you taken out, fished with them, and caught something with them? You know, I've got a a white a big monster eight inch grub that I put on. A, I think it's a number six fluted Indiana blade with a half ounce bell, brass bell weight. Uh, it's sort of like what you'd find on a, a fox spinner. And I think it's a, probably a five or a six aught uh, extreme wide gap worm hook. And I put a, and I was out in uh, Inwood Reservoir, uh, east of Republic, and I started chucking that thing, and my wife looked at it, and it's about about 14 inches long and she's looking at me like what in god's name are you gonna do with that <laughs> and i cast it a couple times and bam the pike just came up and crushed it and you so I, said, I said that's what i'm gonna do with that I'm gonna cast it <laughs> it. right you know that's the thing that's what i love to hear when you know we we we, we talk to you folks that have all these different types of companies is we see what you sell to the public but Behind the scenes, how many times were you out there and you're just staring at it and you're throwing things together and like you said, you just ah, we're just gonna chuck it out there and all of a sudden next you know you're you're bringing in a pike. Yeah, you know that's well, you, awesome. you got to break a few eggs along the way, you know. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I learned that I learned that from a, a close friend of mine. He's a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. I used to fish with in in Washington State. We'd go fishing for uh, for walleye and pike together. Uh, his name's Don Orth, and his his thought process was if you could put more rubber stuff on it, do it. Every time, add more rubber stuff. Yeah. And uh, so he'd have a little beetle spin with a with a six inch grub on a beetle spin, Just because he loved big things. So he'd have these aberrations like, "What in God's name are you thinking?" And he'd catch fish. So every time I look at something, I'm like, "Well, what would Don do?" I'd say he'd probably put more rubber on this thing, and that's what I would do. Well, looking back, uh, when you're in the service and you're making making lures and everything, were you the go-to guy? People come to you as like, "Hey, I, I, you know, I know you're making lures. You know, can I try this? Can I try that?" Uh, how did that all work with with uh, your uh, your fellow people there in uh, the Air Force? I, I really didn't have any finished product when I was when I was uh, in the Air Force active duty. That's where I was screwing around in locations and I never really got to the point where I made something that I thought was even close to good enough to to even hand out to somebody to let them try. Okay. That's just been in the last couple of years up here in, in Rapid River. I, that, I just didn't do that much when I was active duty. I got a lot of ideas from all the different places I fished. But uh, yeah, I didn't get to the point where I thought I'd have something that I feel comfortable handing to somebody and say, "Here, give it a go." Okay. What was that? What was the first time doing that like? Here you are. You're, you got your first. What was your first? What was you? What was your very first lure? Do you well, still have I, that lure? I guess. That I've got one. I don't. I don't even sell them. Um, when I grew up fishing with my dad, my brothers in uh, Messina, New York, there was a spinner called a Wonder Spinner. And it's really weird. It's about an 18-inch monofilament leader. It's a one-ounce. It's tied to a, a one-ounce inline sinker. And it's got about a five-inch wire with a, a number three Colorado blade and a small yellow rooster tail on a single hook. And 
Ken would buy them because they were about 25 cents and we wouldn't have to get into his tackle box and take his big bear devils and, and end up losing those or get them stuck in the rocks. So he would buy a whole, they, they, would, they were selling them on these little trays um, in the tackle stores there. And just hand them to it. Here, go, go, go. And he would chuck it. Maybe we'd catch everything from perch to smallmouth to rock bass to smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, and pike with these wonder spinners. And I wanted to try. I wanted to try to make something like it. I tried when I was in Washington. I really couldn't sort of pin it down. When I got to Ohio, I had time, and I actually got a little fly fishing outfit. And I this is where my wife comes in and she talks about my arts and crafts project. I did cleaners. From the uh, the uh, arts and crafts store and beads, and she's like, "You're not going to make a spinner out of that arts and crafts stuff, are you?" I said, "I'm going to give it a go," and I would make these. I made a pretty good approximation of what I grew up using the Wonder Spinner, but and I probably made three or four hundred of them with different colors. I've never handed them to anybody, and okay. I'm not quite sure why, other than it'd be hard to explain to them how to fish it, because you're t- you'd be tying on to the inline sinker, one ounce inline sinker, and that's above 18 inches of line and no weight below it. Gotcha. And that's just something that would be hard for somebody to swallow and say, what in God's name is this? They cast like a bullet, it gets nice and deep, and fish love them. Yeah. And I, I've, got them, I've got them in my boat. I've never given them to anybody. I've, I would probably never even consider selling. It's sort of like a growing up thing. Maybe, uh, maybe it's just tradition. That's why I made them. But uh, yeah, I've got I got I don't even have a name for them. I've got them sitting in uh, in poly bags in my spinner room. Well, looking back at stuff like that, you know, you talk about tradition uh, and things from a bygone era. Uh, not that we're not that we're not that old, but but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, we revert back to things that we knew worked, you know, at some point in time. Right, exactly. And it's fun to, to try to bring back some of those things, but. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool, right? Um, I know I, I could go out here in the bay. I know I could go out there and catch smallmouth and northerns with them. Mm-hmm. But there's been so many different lures that have come out since then that it just wouldn't make sense to even do that. Maybe just for tradition would be the only reason I'd get out there and throw and I'd catch a fish and I'd smile, say hi to my dad, and uh, and put it back in the tackle box and pull it out again next year, maybe. Well, I mean, you look at what rods are made out of now compared to like using oh, a cane right. pole back in the day. You know, when I was a kid, that's you go out and grandpa would give me a cane pole to fish with. Right, exactly. And and the the last lure I want to talk about, uh, you sent us is the grub spinner. Uh, you sent us two packages. Uh, each has a spinner. Uh, one's brass, one's nickel, and they've got the the the, the green and black. The white chartreuse. Um, yep. yep. And uh, tell me about this hook on this thing, and then explain this guy to us. That is, I use a four-inch grub. I wanted to find something that had a lot of action, and there's so many different grubs out there. And I know there's walleye guys here that like to cast for walleye, as opposed to in, instead of just yanking a, a three-eighths ounce grub off the bottom until your arms are ready to bleed. You can throw this bait, you can throw it near the weeds, and I found that if you put a nickel blade on there with a, with a chartreuse or a white body, um, a, a, uh, a four inch chartreuse or white body, the pike and the smallmouth absolutely crush it. And that's just a one out worm hook. I like the fact you don't have to fight with the treble hook to get it out of their mouth, especially pike. Mm-hmm. You can kill pike so easy trying to get just a hook out of their mouth. When they hit this and you set the hook, Hook goes right up in the, the upper mouth. It's a perfect it's a perfect hook set. They're heavy enough. There's enough flash. They're just fantastic. And when you get out in your in your kayak and you're throwing these along the weed edges or near timber, they're not completely weedless because you've got the blade in the clevis. But where the grub is, if you rig that weedless or if, if you rig a swim bait or whatever you want on it, you rig it weedless, you're going to be in good shape. Okay. And I tell you, smallmouth head of the bay here just last week i just killed the smallmouth with the nickel with the chartreuse and the white they just ate it up you know i i was, I was looking at that and I, I'm, I'm actually thinking uh trying a few other uh besides the grub on there uh this is i want to try a paddle tail on one of these have you ever tried that on one of those i haven't done a paddle tail i've done uh 
some different types of, of grubs that didn't have a wide tail. Yep. All of them, they're a little longer that, that have a, like a chartreuse and orange that has a really small tail at the end. But any of them with that type of action is going to be, you're going to have success with it. I think, uh, they're, just, they're just a good combination of size, blade size, hook size, and a three or four inch grub or a three or four inch um, twin bait or something is a perfect size for bass and pike. You're not overdoing it, and you're not too small that you're going to be bit on. Adam Wynn's commenting about it right now. He says it, a lot of action off of that. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, that grub just, man, it, it just twists and, you know, twister tail just really cruises. You got some great fin, uh, some good color. You can go darker uh, in darker water, for, and uh, you can throw it through, through some weeds to get the to get it some the walleye that are sort of hiding in the weeds where you can't get them with a crawler harness, and you're sick of throwing a jig, mm -hmm. and they're sick of seeing a jig. Well, this is a little different. Something just a little bit different. Yeah, it's pretty unique. You don't see many many lures out there where you can change the the, the main body of it, change it out, and it's not expensive. You can put a, a nickel grub on there or a little swim bait or something, find what works for you, and just chuck it. Exactly, and 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 Mark Coleman has finally joined us, and uh, he's off to a flying start. As he says, I'm safe uh, from fish because they love big things. <laughs> um, and also, Mark Coleman asked, "Do you have to tune the spinners, grub spinners, or anything like that?" Uh, no, as long as you've got the right combination of clevis and the bead that's under the clevis and the right size blade, there's no tuning. Once in a while, a pike will take your wire out of whack a little bit. You got to straighten it up a little bit. But as long as you don't damage the wire where the clevis is, you're golden. You're good. And there you go, folks. And um, what's the retail on one of these by the chance the um the grub, the spinner. grub spinners i put i put different color grubs with each one retail is right around seven dollars and it comes with it comes with the two two it grubs? comes with two different grubs yeah with a nickel i'll put the, the white and chartreuse in with a nickel uh to give people a, a little bit of a, a choice there and with the brass blade i'll put like a, a oil fleck and a black the, for the dark day, darker days, and if you want to throw it around the weeds for uh, smallmouth or for walleye, so that's called oil flack. Uh, it's 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 motor oil. There's there's everybody has every company has their own different term right. for, it, for it. But gold, the gold uh, flake in the motor oil color has a real eye catcher, and it's dark enough where maybe a little bit like a goby or right, or, like, uh, like you were saying, like match match the bait fish. Yeah, um, try to match. What, what's in the area? If you're in Rocky area, you're going to match for crayfish, or, or you're going to match for gobies anywhere in the Great Lakes, really, for gobies. Smallmouth and gobies just sort of go hand in hand. So there you have it. He has literally got a spinner bait for just about everything available here in Michigan and beyond. And a great place to use them right here in Michigan. Right, exactly. If you want to go a little bit smaller or even going up to the big one and a half, you know, the, the, this guy right here, you know. He's got it, and he's been uh, he's been doing really good up there in Rapid River. And uh, folks, if you're available and you you have time to get over to the show on November third, fourth, and fifth, you can actually talk to Patrick live in his booth. And of course, we're going to be there, so you know something's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, something's going to happen. All right. Right. Uh, so, but. Other than that, uh, get over to Facebook, check out his Facebook page. If you want to uh, purchase any of these, uh, reach out to him through Facebook. Uh, I think he's got his email here as well. Uh, you can get a hold of him, get the prices for each and individual ones that he has out there, and uh, he will be uh, glad to take care of you. Now, at the show, I, I gotta assume you're gonna have a a full spread of, of all of your lures there available to purchase? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll have everything that you've seen here, plus uh, I, might, I may bring out some of my, my odds and ends, my my uh, Frankenstein projects. Okay. Uh, I've got some big uh, number 10 Indiana Blade uh, musky lures that uh, I've screwed around with a little bit that uh, I'll have out there. Um, kids, the kids love them. They look at them and say, what do you catch with that? <laughs> I don't catch anything with them, but some guys do. Right? Hey, uh, well, yeah, I'll have everything out there. Another question from Mark Coleman. Uh, and and I, I understand this question. What is your opinion on a pink grub color? Pink? Um, 
I've had really good success. Bubblegum isn't far off from pink. I've had really good success throwing uh, bubblegum senkos in North Idaho for smallmouth and for largemouth. I haven't used it much out here, but I think color catches fishermen more than it catches fish. But some people just swear by, if, if it's not this color, I'm not going to use it. Well, if you use a certain color long enough, you're going to catch fish on it, and that's what you're going to swear by. Right, exactly. And, and, I, and I know Tammy's got a tackle box full of the pink. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, but you're right about that. Some when you when you go look at look at the the racks of all the the different rubbers that they have the rubber lures the grubs the cincos all the different colors metal flake you name it man fish must get confused at times <laughs> hey that, yeah what that's what pink. the lake looks like anything like that is there anything that that's pink in the lake that uh, that a fish would want to eat it's me but. Uh... They still work from time to time, so right, you know, it, them. exactly. So you know, y y I don't know. Sometimes I, I like you, I, I might buy it just out of sheer curiosity of, okay, I got one. Yep. Am I gonna catch anything with it? Got to find out. We'll throw it and try it. Got to throw it. So, but um, but other than that, um, you know, we, we can't wait to see you up at the show. But we got a few questions uh, that we do want to ask you as a newbie to our show. And so, if you are ready, sure. uh, oh, Tammy's calling me out. No, I don't. D yeah. lies, all lies. <laughs> um, I think she's got a pink tackle box too. Uh, probably. Oh, what is the best knot to use to tie these to your line? I always, I've been using a trilene knot since I was a kid. My dad never showed me. I learned it on my own. He had his weird roll it over eight times, put it back through a thing that I couldn't tie as a kid. I learned to try and lean knot, and it's never failed me. Okay. All right. Um, it's also called a polymer knot. Okay. So, there you go. You. If you had some line there, I'd have you tie one because I want to see it. But <laughs> I can go. They're, they're simple. They're right? simple and they work. YouTube. That and the YouTube, you know. And when we do our when we do our live spot up there, we're going to have some fun with you there. And But, uh, you know, as a newbie to the show, one of the questions we got a few questions and one of them is so you're traveling to wherever you're going to go up to camp you're going to travel wherever taking your uh, huds fishing lures on on a little excursion wherever you might go what are you listening to on the radio <laughs> um my wife talked me into getting a serious radio and it's usually um classic rewind or this, this 70s, I think it's the 70s channel. Seven on 70s. And I'm, uh, I'm not a young guy, and uh, on the far end of my dial, or on the far end of my, my screen there, she's got the uh, hair bands, because she's younger than I am, so she's got the, every once in a while, I'm listening to some good old Simon and Garfunkel, and she hits Cinderella or Winger or some, <laughs> something like that, that's blasting on my stereo, and she's bouncing around in the seat, I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Uh, okay, so who controls the radio? You or her? She does. Okay. I like them already. Classic rewind to hair bands. Yeah. Uh, you, you make a great couple, trust me, because that's how it works in my truck. It's like yeah, we got it. We got it all covered there. Exactly until right. My, until my daughter hops in and she wants this '80s pop stuff for I don't know what that is. Well, that's not bad either. Eight, eight, '80s on eight. Um, it's when you get up into the. I, I don't do the rap thing, so we pass on that. So, okay, so you're listening to the classic Rewind as you're tooling down the road, you and the wife hanging out, jamming. She switches the station on you. What's your go-to snack that you have in the truck? Um, I don't snack in the truck. She'll have mints, and she'll have gum, but I won't snack in my truck. It's too damn expensive to make mess, to make a mess in my truck, so I don't <laughs> snack in the truck. <laughs> he, he, goes, he said he doesn't. He didn't say that she doesn't, though. Right? Do you, do you let her snack in the truck? She'll, she'll have mentioned, you know, I'll be out every once in a while. If I'm going to camp and it's early in the morning, she'll make me a sandwich of some sort. And and when I hit M69, uh, when there's no traffic, I'll start mowing on my sandwich. But uh, other than that, I just don't do it. You take okay. you take two over to 69 and up through? Uh, yep, I, 69 up through Felch, up to 95 to my camp in Republic. Yep, through Segola. Up through Segola and that, that nice little back road there where the the uh, 
lumber trucks go 65 miles an hour in a 55, and there's deer around every bend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty pretty scary at times. I make that left-hander that had Crystal Falls at that point, so it's like, uh, oh, Mark Coleman's a hair nation. All right, uh, we do have another question. For someone who has never thrown a spinnerbait, what is a, a good pointer to them and how to fish it? You know, you can't go wrong uh, with a, a white 3 8 ounce spinnerbait for bass or pike, but you've got to, you can't use a leader and you can't use a swivel. You got to tie direct to either the R bend or the loop. And I make most of mine with a loop because I don't like the R bend. Sometimes a knot will slide off the R bend. So I'd say tie directly to it and tie it by a, a, a tight knot so it doesn't slide up and down the wire on the bend. There you go. Tie it right is a, a great pointer because nothing worse than tying it wrong and this knot slips out and there goes your little Tie it right and, and tie it tight. Right? There you yep. go. Uh, okay, back to our fun questions. Um, Mike and Dan are coming over for dinner. What would be the meal that you would say, hey, guys, you're here for dinner. I am going to cook you. What would be the... <laughs> won't be pasties, much to my wife's chagrin. <laughs> uh, it'd either be kudigi or tater tot casserole. Kudigi. kudigi. Explain. That's an Italian sausage patty with a uh, piece of sauce, mushrooms, and cheese on it on a bun. Uh, I first uh, had it in Ishpeming. There's a, a Lowry. I think it's called Lowry's. My wife introduced me to it. When we were visiting, when we first uh, after we first got married, check it out, Kudigi. It's uh, C U D G I H I, I think, or C U H D G I. Uh, it's spelled weird, but uh, it's a great sandwich. Uh, yeah. A Kudigi sandwich on a grill with a uh, provolone cheese and uh, and the sauce. All right. So good. when you get the correct spelling, text it to me, and I, I'm gonna have to look that look one up. up. That sounds interesting. It's um, good. Really good. Is she originally from Michigan? Yeah, she's she's a youper. She's from Ishpeming. Okay. That, uh, thus the pasty. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's she's a pasty machine, and I I I call them dirt bombs. I shouldn't say that live on UP, but uh, <laughs> I've tried them before. And anytime you need to have a quart of ketchup next to you, there's an issue. Ketchup. <laughs> That's oh. what they put on their pasties. No, they no, no. Tur- Traditionalists use ketchup. You cannot use gravy. Okay, so that's why I'm a troll from down under who uses that's right. gravy. There you go. No, you can't use gravy. You wouldn't use, use gravy in our house. My wife would have your head. It'd have to be ketchup. I'd sneak it. <laughs> um, would you? Okay, so going back to tying the right knot, would you fast retrieve it or slow retrieve it? Um, it depends on if you're in a weedy area or shallow water. Pike loves something fat. You couldn't retrieve it fast enough to keep it away from a pike. So I'd, I'd chuck it and, and just bring it back and cover as much water as you could. There you go. All right, uh, last fun question that we have. Uh, we, we've had this great meal that you prepared for us, Kudi, and um, we're sitting down by the fire, and you, you, you say, Mike and Dan, this is a story that I've got to tell you that resonates with me. Uh, from the outdoors or whatever it might be when you were younger, when you're older. It might have just happened yesterday. What would that story be? When uh, I was in Desert Storm, it's got nothing to do with the outdoors. It's just something that one of the strangest things that's ever happened to me. Um, I was on an island called Masira uh, off the coast of Oman in the Persian Gulf, and I was there with the B-52s and uh, KC-135s, and we had... Uh, step down transformers because everything there was 220 and everything we had was 110 and we had transformers plugged into everything and a Omani gentleman uh, wearing a robe came walking into our we had a, a hangar with a tent and I did logistics I had aircraft parts and he came walking in there and he didn't speak English and he wanted a transformer he was sort of you know pointing towards it you wanted a transformer and I, I couldn't just hand him something like that, I couldn't just give him uh, American military equipment. So he, he sort of looked a little shy and he walked away. And about an hour later, he came back and, and he had him, uh, he was holding the hand of about, I'd say, an 11 or 12 year old girl. 
he wanted to trade me his, I believe it was his daughter, a trans woman. He, he tried to hand me her hand and uh, in exchange for a, a step down transformer. And I, I was sort of blown away. I'm like, I didn't even know what to say. And I didn't want to start an international incident with this Omani gentleman. But uh, I'm not even sure how I got out of it. But I swear he wanted to give me his daughter. Wow. Uh, in exchange for a transformer. <laughs> let, let, me, let me go talk to the higher ups. That was something. Wow. Uh, something I, I've never experienced anything like that before. Nothing to do with the outdoors. It's just uh No, but that, I tell you what. It's a sweet story. Yeah. You'll, you'll never forget that story, that's for it, sure. You know, well, it, you're just talking about different cultural cultural differences, really. I mean, in what has value versus what we hold dear to our hearts. You know, I mean, it's. Right? Wow. Yeah. Cool. Weird. Yeah. Tom Gensel's chiming in. Kudi. C U D I G H I. Oh, yeah. That's it. That's it. Yep. So, obviously, Tom Gensel must have tried him. He must have tried him. Or... Tom, are you from the UP by chance? Just wonder. But, you know, a story like that has nothing to do with the outdoor, and it, it, it will. He'll remember that from now on. Absolutely. I, I cannot imagine. Yeah. That just, here, take this child, and I want to transform. Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Wow. You in for the <laughs> after-dinner story. That's right. <laughs> of forever. And uh, But, no, th those are the questions we like to ask, kind of lighten up the mood as we get towards the end of the show. And uh, if you could, where could we go find you at Hud's Lures? Uh, Facebook, correct? Oh, I'm on Facebook. Um, email HudsFishingLures at Yahoo.com. Um, and uh, check out one of the locations where uh, where I've got my, my gear uh, for sale. Exactly. And if you want to find out where he has some of his gear for sale, give him a shout, email him. He'll gladly tell you where his stores are, that he has them uh, in the UP, and he's got one in the lower. So, uh, And remember, folks, if you're going to be in Escanada for November 3, 4, and 5, the biggest show expo in the up the up ice fishing and hunting expo november three four and five yours truly mr mike and adam will be there uh i'm pretty sure finding trouble we can find trouble yeah trouble seems to find us right exactly so anything else for our oh tom says he's born and raised in flint michigan just fyi so he's not from the up so he's been up there right He's familiar with Kudigi. Is that how you sp that's how you pronounce it, right? Kudigi. Kudigi. There we go. So, do you have anything else for our guests? No. Uh, well, I, I could ask a million questions, but uh, we're running out of time. So, uh, right? I think yeah, we'll wrap it up. But I tell you, if if you'll hang on with us here after the show, we're gonna wrap up the show. Just stay on the line with us here uh, briefly, and then we'll let you go. But uh, for those of you who listen to the podcast version of this over on iTunes, make sure you stop in, give us a review there. That helps us and helps the people who support us and for those of you who are on the live stream right now take and and go over to huds lures on facebook smash that like button do the same for us as well and any of the other social media outlets that we're on uh that helps people who support us as well and, and for those of you that. listening listening to the podcast um you got to go over to facebook yeah because we showed some things here live on the show we live product we can't we can't put the product through the the earpiece, but uh, well, we could hook you, but uh, you'd have an earring, right? <laughs> <laughs> an earring, and so uh, within a few days, the show will be also on our YouTube channel over there. So feel free to go over there to YouTube, look at it, subscribe. We'd be glad to have you, subscriber. Something else that we just started that we're starting to play with a little bit is uh, TikTok. I've got five videos over there from my vacation, outdoor related, all kayaking right now. So hopefully, uh, we can get this thing up and running. You guys will start to see some videos from us in the outdoors. So that's right. So uh, next week uh, we'll talk some more fishing about our fishing trip. We can do that and vacation and all yep. that kind of good stuff. So yeah, I was on the water five days, five days in a row. So we got a lot to talk about, a lot of pictures to show. So Tom Gensel, Ralph's Deli in Ishpeming. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that must be they where do, we they, do they do great pizza and great goodie. Okay, sounds like a stop. I know, right? 
I think I might have to go through there when I go up to Lake of the Clouds. You can take 28 across if you want. And yeah. So go all the way through there. So we'll have to check it out. Absolutely. So that'll do it for us this week. We'll be back again next Wednesday night, 7:30, same time, and uh, we'll kind of catch up on some things since we've been gone the last couple weeks. Yep. So, so everybody, take care. We'll see y'all again next week. It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out.